good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Amen. I want to say to all of God's people, God bless you. We're about to get started with our third segment of Money Matters. Hallelujah. And if you'd like to learn more about money, if you know someone, amen, who'd like to have a biblical perspective of their giving, of, of, of their saving, and of their investing. We're about to go into our third segment of Money Matters. Amen. We're about to break bread. We're about to have a discussion. Amen. And so I want to invite you to go ahead, amen, and invite your friends and your family members to join us, amen, for this very brief discussion on Money Matters. This is our third segment. Amen. If you're already logged in, go ahead and say, God bless you, Pastor. Hello. Hallelujah. Now, I know we have persons who who join us from all over the country, amen. So wherever you may be, be just type in the comments and say, hey, I'm, we, we participating from Texas or we participating from Dallas, wherever, they, wherever you may be, Memphis, wherever you are, just type in the comments and say, hey, pastor, God bless you, amen, and join us for this time of worship, hallelujah, amen. I'm gonna give you guys an opportunity. I'm gonna pull up some of my notes and my information. I'm all ready to go, ready to have, I got my tea, I got a nice beverage made by my lovely wife, amen, I'm ready for this discussion with God's people, amen, hey sister Kiani, love you girl, sister Leslie, bless you, bless you, kiss your son for us, sister Olivia, kiss that baby Mar for us, what's up Tati, love you girl, God bless you. Peace and prosperity multiplied to you. Hey, man, if y'all don't know this, we just got off a powerful prayer call. And uh, if you don't have, if you don't know that God is still moving in the midst and he's still answering prayer, I want to encourage you to join our Friday night prayer calls. Man, we are calling down fire, thunder, and lightning from heaven. And God is inspiring and encouraging his people in the midst. So thank you so much. Amen. Sister Jessica and that beautiful baby Skylar. Hallelujah. They have joined us. Bless you, lady. Love you, love you, love you. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you. Alana, love you, girl. Brother Doug, my big brother. I love you, man. I love you. I love you. All right. So with that being said, let's go ahead and uh, get started. I'd like to ask you all, like I mentioned before, amen, uh, we're going to do a little bit of an overview, uh, but I want to encourage you that if you have a family member or a loved one uh, that you believe that might be, uh, that might benefit from this discussion, why don't you go ahead and uh, forward them over the link and uh, connect them with us, amen, so that they can take a look and say, pastor's about to talk and teach about money, hallelujah, God is, a, God, the Lord is about to speak to us about money, hallelujah, everybody's talking about money, especially during these times, amen, and so we want to make certain that we have not only a biblical perspective, but a Christological lens in which we perceive and how we manage our financial affairs, all right, so here's what I'm going to do, I'm going to open this with a word of prayer, then we're going to jump right on in there, all right? So gracious God, I thank you. I thank you for those that have gathered for this moment so that we can search the scriptures. For God, as we search the scriptures, we believe that we find you. And so, Lord, we thank you right now that you are giving us wisdom, insight, and understanding that only you can give so that we can manage our financial affairs in a manner and in a way that glorifies you, that reminds us that we are surrendered and submitted to the authority of Jesus Christ. So Lord, speak to us, grant us wisdom, grant us favor, grant us your authority, and we'll be careful to give you all the praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. Thank God. And amen. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Amen. One of the things that I love about this particular discussion and the way in which we have set this up is that I literally, I've invited you into my home and I want you to be, uh, it, I want us to have a discussion about finances and a discussion about money, literally as if you were sitting across the coffee table with me. And so I've got my pen and my pad. I got my Bible, got some I got a hot beverage here, amen, for one of my sons in the Lord might be saying, Pastor, what are you drinking? I'm drinking tea, hallelujah, with lemon and some, some honey, so it's delicious, hallelujah. And, uh, and so we're going to have a nice, warm, comforting, and inviting conversation about money. The intent of this discussion is not to use shame. Shame does not work in producing lasting change. It might give us a moment 
of shift, but it, it does not produce lasting shame, uh, change. And so that's why we're not going to use shame. We're not going to beat people up about the poor decisions that they've made about money. We want to teach. We want to dialogue. We want to have a discussion. All right. And so the first thing we want to do, because this is not just an earthly discussion about money. This is a spiritual one. We recognize that money is a reflection not only of our heart, but also our relationship with Jesus Christ. And so we want to make certain that all that we do is founded upon the word of God. And it is based upon how we are identifying meaning in money, meaning in the word so that we can shift Hallelujah, how we manage our financial affairs. Is that all right? Say it's all right in the comments for me. All right, thank you, Jesus. So here we are, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Y'all know that. Jesus instructs his followers in that great sermon on the mount, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his what? His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you as well. Do you truly believe that? Do we as believers believe what God has spoken through his word? Do we truly embody and embrace the spiritual reality of what Jesus Christ has spoken unto his blood-washed, spirit-filled believers, hallelujah, that what he said is that if you seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all these things shall be added unto us as well. Hallelujah. So that's why we want to begin our third and what I will call the final plan segment uh, now, we can obviously continue, but a third and planned final segment of our Money Matters discussion, and it is titled Generosity Beyond the Tide. Generosity Beyond the Tide. If you heard what I said, just put that in the comments. Come on, you talk back to me. I get us out of here. Generosity Beyond the Tide. Now, I want to be clear. Um, I am not a financial advisor, and I don't pretend to be one on Facebook Live. My job, however, uh, as a pastor is to relay Christ and theology to everyday life and living, which means that we have to offer a prophetic and a priestly critique of how our culture and how we as Christians should view money. Again, my job is not to embarrass anyone. It's not to shame you about the previous financial decisions or even the present ones that you're currently thinking about. But I simply want to offer us a perspective that is rooted in biblical interpretation of scripture so that we can do like what Haggai the prophet said, consider our ways. Now, because we have it, we have a family dialogue. I'm your pastor. I'm your brother. We have a family dialogue. And I want to share with you all a really quick story just about myself. Um, and so there's a number of things. We, we all have our own uh, backgrounds and histories and things that have been impressed upon us in terms of how we value and, uh, and even how we view uh, money. And so I was taught uh, to, uh, to tithe uh, by my pastor in Houston, Texas. I was first discipled in a uh, Baptist church. My first Christian experience was in a Baptist church and they impressed upon me the importance of tithing. And, and I also remember uh, my, uh, my, I call him my dear Uncle Don. Uncle Don taught me as a young boy, he says, one of the things you should do is, uh, is that you should not only give a tenth, but you should save a tenth. And so that was something that was impressed upon me as sound wisdom in my life because he was an executive at Coca-Cola. So I looked to him and I looked to his family and I said, man, that's something that I want to do. Now, with that being said, I need you to understand that my family, um, early on when I was a you know, young whippersnapper, uh, we experienced numerous, more than I can count, evictions. Uh, we were let, we were kicked out of places. We were asked to move out of places and uh, we constantly had financial challenges. So I was not born with a silver spoon in my mouth uh, in that particular sense. And, uh, and I can remember one particular eviction um, that was especially memorable because my entire family, we had to move in with a narcoleptic stranger. This person we didn't know, we met him the same day while we were putting our things on the U-Haul. I can still remember asking my mother, where are we going to live? Uh, and, and praise be to God, God touched the heart of a stranger who we did not know. And uh, me and my siblings and my mother, we all ended up sleeping on the floor in this one bedroom apartment. And, uh, and I remember making an inner vow to myself. I told myself, while I lay there looking out that window at the stars, I said, I will never let this happen to my family. I'll never let this happen to myself. And so that became one of the ways in which I have viewed money. So when I was at the age of 10, I, I've embraced this, uh, uh, this, this very keen um, work ethic. 
But also because of my traumatic experience, I developed my traumatic experience with homelessness. Um, I became miserly. I became uh, stingy. I became one that says I need to save. I need to make sure that I have money so that I am never, ever in this predicament. So I worked hard. Uh, I saved. I did all of those things. I wanted to go to school because that's what they told me what would do so I can get some money. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Hallelujah. We choose some, some people choose to be doctors not because uh, they feel a calling to, to, to administer care and compassion to others, but they want to get some money. They're tired of being broke. And uh, there's some of us, we've chosen our careers and our vocations, not because we have a genuine aspiration or desire to work in that particular field, but we chose it because I don't like being broke. Hallelujah. And, uh, and so I found, myself, uh, I, I found myself as a disciple needing God to recalibrate that. I needed God to recalibrate my relationship with money uh, because my relationship with money was birthed out of fear. It was birthed out of a uh, traumatic experience of homelessness where I developed this, this inner vow that I would never, ever allow this to happen. So I, I've offered that particular story to you because I want you to understand that I am learning how to grow in the area of managing my affairs in a way that is reflective of God's heart as well as the kingdom of heaven. And so I want to offer to you the hope that some of you all that might have the same experience, maybe you don't. Hallelujah. Maybe, maybe you've had a positive experience with money. So we're going to build for you. We have some words for you as well. All right. So we've organized our time around three sessions. Let the church say three sessions. All right. Three sessions. Now, the first was on savings and budget. Y'all remember that? Now, savings and budget. Now, we explored the importance of having an emergency fund. And we wanted you to also, not simply to make a budget, but just to know where do you spend your money? How much do you spend uh, on, um, on toiletries? How much do you spend on groceries? How much do you spend with HelloFresh? And how much do you spend with Starbucks? How, how much do you spend? Do you know, girl? How little, do you know, brother, how, how much you spend? Thank you, Lord Jesus. And, and as we begin to reflect upon that, then we say, okay, now that you have a sense of what you're spending, let's create a plan just to save $1,000. I know many of you all are familiar with the wisdom that is offered during our time of having three to six months of, uh, of discretionary income to support your one's expenses in the event of the loss of employment or some other emergency. And uh, But we recognize that sometimes it's difficult to get to that large of a number. So we put a challenge out to everyone, save $1,000, and then we can go, uh, go from there. And then we also said that this is a time for those of you who are courting and dating, we wanted to encourage you, amen, to have a discussion with your boo. Hallelujah. Now, the discussion with your boo about savings and budget wasn't necessarily for you to open up your financial records to them, but it was simply to get a sense of how they view money. Do they believe in having a savings account? Do they believe in having a budget? Do they have a budget? You're not asking what the budget is. You're just wondering, do you have one? Do you manage your affairs in that particular sense, okay? And, and in that particular sense. And then we also encourage families, husbands and wives, it's time for us to have discussions about money. Even if you are not the one who is the most prolific in terms of managing the affairs, I've seen many couples, sometimes the husband is the one that manages the affairs or the wife is the one that does so. Well, listen, both of, one of you, both of you can't be ignorant. Somebody has to learn. And the other person, so I was encouraging even families, go and talk to your families. Talk to your children about your budgets and your savings and, and some of the different goals that you have for your family, all right? Then last time that we gathered, we talked about uh, debt and investments. Hallelujah. That was, a, that was an interesting discussion, debt and investments. And one of the things that we looked at from the scriptures is that we said that if you're in debt, you, that means you don't have the freedom to use your money in the way that you want. That includes home mortgage, school loans, car loans, and uh-oh, credit cards. Credit cards, credit cards, credit cards. Hallelujah. So we encourage the people of God, it's time to get our spending in order. Then, um, and then once we get our spending in order, we got to get our savings in order. Then we can get our sowing in order. And once we have the right order, we can save, we can sow, and then we can spend. Save, sow, spend. Simple concept to remember. Save, sow, spend. Save, sow, spend. Save, sow, spend. Now, we also talked about the importance. We talked about diversifying your portfolio, uh, hedging your risk, uh, also being mindful of these get-rich-quick schemes. Especially during the pandemic, one of the things I want to caution the people of God of doing is 
Be mindful of persons or institutions or individuals that may come to you asking you to take your 401k and put it into something that promises you a guaranteed return no matter what happens in the market. That is a scam, all right? There's inherent risk with investment. So we also, investments, which also talked about the importance of hedging that risk. So today we want to talk about generosity beyond the tide. Generosity beyond the tide. Now I know what you're saying. You're saying, what does that mean? I'm going to give you this definition. Are you ready? Now, for those of you all who are typing and writing notes, I need y'all to help me. You'll write this in the comments for me. Okay. Generosity beyond the tide. Here's what it is. Generosity for a disciple is planned kindness, discerning and desiring an outlet. Let me say that again. Hallelujah. Woo! That, I felt a little shout in my spirit when I, when I said it. Ready? Let me say it again. Generosity for a disciple. I'm talking about followers of Jesus Christ. Is planned kindness, discerning, and desiring an outlet. Hallelujah. Planned kindness, discerning, and desiring an outlet. An outlet is simply a mode of expression. It's planned though. It's not spontaneous. It's planned. I desired and I designed my financial standing so I can be kind to other people. It is planned kindness, discerning and desiring an outlet. Here's why this is important. We are built as believers by heaven's design to be generous givers. The God that we serve, the Bible says, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave. Hallelujah, his only begotten son, whosoever should believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. If God is a lover, he has designed you and I to be lovers as well. And what is a lover? A lover is known by the love that proceeds from them. God so loved that he gave. Hallelujah. So God desires us to fit the design that is consistent and compatible with his presence. So we accentuate this design by ordering and reordering our use of money by allowing our daily lives to be changed or to, ch to be changed by our immersion into the spiritual reality of what I want to call abundance and enoughness. So here's the word. You have been designed by God to be generous. By intentionality, when God set out the silhouette and the contours of your personality, your perspective, your purpose, he intended for it to be generous. He intended for you to be a lover Hallelujah. And one to be loved. That means not only are you to receive the love of God, but you are to give the love of God. And now here's what we have to do as recipients and distributors of God's divine love in a generous spirit. We want to accentuate the design. There's a way. Thank you, Jesus, that we can accentuate God's intentional design of us. And here's how we do it. We got to immerse ourselves into a spiritual reality of abundance and enoughness. <coughs> Excuse me. I didn't cough on my elbow. I'm sorry. <coughs> Thank you, Lord. So when we think about this, this helps us to clearly answer a very important question that our lives are going to have to stand up and respond to. And it's this. How well our economic witness corresponds with the unique call of God for our lives. Let me say that again. How well does your economic witness correspond with the unique call of God upon your life? Note what I said. I know some of you all have never heard that term before. You've never seen witness and economics combined together. Hallelujah. God is not just looking for your Hadamashande and how many scriptures you can quote and how many tongues you can speak in. There's another way in which we can witness to the earth by way of what our pocketbook says. Our heart is reflected. Our witness is reflected in where our money goes, where your heart is, there your treasure will lie 
also. You want to know scripture? I know. Hallelujah. Let everything be established by two or three witnesses. We're not here to shame. We're here to educate. We're here to inform. We're here to inspire. You know what Philippians chapter 4, hallelujah, I think it's verse 5 says? It says, let your moderation be made known to all men that the Lord is at hand. Do you not know that your modest, moderate behavior says God is soon to return? That even though you can afford a BMW 750, you elect and you intentionally choose to drive a Prius because you have made the decision that you're, <laughs> someone said, I ain't pastor, really, you want me to drive a Prius? Yeah, I ain't say that. I'm just saying, let your moderation be made known to all men that the Lord is at hand. So that's the question that all of us are going to have to answer. We have to answer the economic question as to whether or not our witness, when I say witness, I'm talking about the life you bear. We're all this month, we're talking about calling and vocation. Do you not know that associated with your calling is an expectation of economic witness and it goes beyond the tithe? Let that sit for a minute. Let that sit. Hallelujah. Let me drink. Yes, Lord. Some of y'all, some of some of y'all not sure if you should tune in. Stay here, stay here. We having a conversation. It's fine. All right. So, Pastor, I'm a you know. Now I mentioned to you all, I was discipled. Beautiful uh, Baptist ministry. They taught me the joy and the blessing of tithing. So, as a pastor who serves at Shekinah Christian Fellowship, I teach the joy and the blessing of tithing. And there are many that believe, however, that their generosity ends. Once they have given a tithe of their income, there are many persons who believe that once they have given, whoo, pastor, you teach it, hallelujah, that once you have fulfilled what is expected of you and obey God's righteous commandment, bring ye the tithe into the storehouse that there might be meat in my house. Prove me now here with, said the Lord of hosts, and I will open up the windows of heaven and pour you out blessing that you have not room enough to receive. Hallelujah. And many of us, we quote that, we pay our tithes faithfully, and I want to celebrate you for doing so. Hallelujah. But I'm also encouraging you to a different kind of financial generosity. Here's why. Tithing is usually understood. Now, remember, what's the title of today's lesson? Generosity beyond the tithe. So once you got your savings in order, you know what your budget looks like. You got your debt and your investments in order. Now we want to talk about generosity beyond 10%. Here's why this is important. Because tithing is usually understood as being a tenet of the Mosaic Covenant. How many of y'all have heard that before? The tithing is an Old Testament principle. Hallelujah. Note that I intentionally said Mosaic covenant because the principle of tithing actually traces back to the book of Genesis. Hallelujah. That teach a little bit. Tithing didn't start with Moses. Tithing started with Abraham. And if Abraham is the father of faith, he gave a tithe or a tenth to Melchizedek even before the Mosaic Covenant was ratified by Moses over 400 years later. Preach past to him. That's a good word right there for somebody. Hallelujah. So tithing, when it was instituted in the Mosaic Covenant, it was an expectation of the law in which the Israelites gave a tithe. Now, just to be clear, what is a tithe? A tithe is 10%. It's not 1%. Some of y'all been doing 1%. It ain't 1%. It ain't 0.1%. Some of y'all been doing 0.1%. It's 10%. 0.1. 10 cents of every dollar from the Mosaic Covenant was expected, hallelujah, to be given to the tabernacle or to the temple for the benefit of the Levites, Okay. So most of us, we know tithing in that particular sense. But can we teach? Because we're here to teach Bible. We're here to teach. We're here to have a discussion. If you look within the Old Testament, hallelujah, there were actually multiple tithes. There was more than one. There was more than one tithe. So as many of us have been taught, we have been encouraged around the principle of tithing. Now, persons who are then pointing and saying this is an Old Testament principle, well, the first question sometimes you got to ask people is, when they say, well, I give a tenth, well, the first question is you should ask is, which one? 
which tithe or which tenth are you even talking about? Hallelujah. So let's go through the word of God. You guys want to see what the word of God says? So let's talk about the general tithe. Numbers chapter 18. Numbers chapter 18. If this is helping somebody, say this is helping. This is helping. Just put something. Put, to, to talk to me in the comments. Say, Pastor, this is helping. Numbers chapter 18. All right. Y'all know the book of Numbers. That's when God gave Moses to number the people. Hallelujah. Now, if you look at verse 21 of chapter 18, Numbers 18, 21 through 26. And it says, and behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tenth in Israel for an inheritance. Those of y'all who know the story, amen, I want you to write that down. Take a look at the remaining verses because I want to move expeditiously through the remainder of the content. But here's the premise. The Levites were the ones who were zealous for the things of God. And because of that, God gave them the special inheritance of, of representing the nation of Israel, hallelujah, in form of offering and sacrifice. But because then they would not have a land or property or an inheritance, God says, now here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to designate a portion of the offerings given by the people in order to be your inheritance. So that tip or that tithe was paid to the Levites to fund, hallelujah, and to compensate them for their service within the temple and within the tabernacle. That was the first tithe. Let's church write in the comments and say, that's the first one. That's the general tithe. We'll call that the general tithe. All right. Then there is the next tithe. Turn to Deuteronomy. Now this next tithe is one you probably haven't heard much about, but it's one that's important for us to be aware of because it's going to help us to orientate our minds around what it means to be generous beyond the tithe because I want to connect giving with your calling. I want to connect giving with your calling. Giving goes beyond just um, philanthropy. Giving is associated with who God is uniquely expecting you and I to be. We're givers. Deuteronomy. I'm talking and I ain't turning. Hallelujah. Deuteronomy chapter 14, verses 22 through 27. All right. Write those down if you get a chance. Let me say it again. Deuteronomy uh, chapter 14. Y'all know when I get excited, I start talking fast. I'm sorry. Deuteronomy chapter 14, verses 22 through 27. All right. So here we hear, here we now have a different tithe. Let the church say different tithe. Then it says, thou shalt truly tithe of the increase of thy seed that field, that the field bringeth forth year by year. Look at verse 23. And thou shalt eat mm, before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose to place his name there. Now I want you to look at verse 26 because you don't hear this all the time, but I want you to see verse 26. And thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul desires. Woo! Hallelujah! For oxen or for sheep or for wool or for wine or for strong, it says, or, or for whatsoever thy soul desire, and thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God, and thou shalt rejoice, thou and thine household. See, it's important for us. This is why we got to come to Bible study. In the Old Testament, there were three festivals that required those that were Judaizers, those that uh, uh, considered themselves to be a part of the Jewish tradition, they were to return home for these feasts, Passover, Pentecost, and Booths, all right? They were to return home, hallelujah, for those three feasts on an annual basis. Now, you know, if you have to travel from a far distance, y'all know it takes money to do that, right? Yes. And so God literally was telling them, I want you to tithe, save your money so that you can come worship. Save enough money so that you can come before my presence and enjoy me as well as my entire, as well as your entire household. That's the, the other tithe. All right. Let me give you the third and final one because I got to move quickly. I'm gonna, so that's what I would call, there's some people who call that the worship tithe. Now I'm going to call this next one the welfare tithe. This is in Deuteronomy chapter 14. Just skip down to verse 28. And it says, at the end of three years, thou shalt bring forth, look at that word again, hallelujah, all the tithe, hallelujah, of thine increase the same year 
and shall lay it up, up, up within thy gates. And here's verse 29. I need you to see it. And the Levite, because he have no part, no inheritance with thee, and the stranger, and the fatherless, and the widow, which are within thy gates, shall come, and they shall eat and be satisfied, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thine hand, which thou hast do, which thou hast do it. Here's literally what that means. Every three years, they were also expected to bring another tithe, but this tithe was for the less fortunate. This tithe were for those, hallelujah, those that were fatherless, orphans who had no inheritance, widows who had no financial, uh, uh, who had no subsidy by way of a hus uh, husband. So, uh, um, and then you also have the, the stranger, the girl, hallelujah, those persons who, who did not share in the inheritance of God. God literally says, I have a way in which I'm going to provide for everybody through the generosity of the people who have been redeemed, saved, and delivered by me. So what does that mean? Generosity beyond the tithe tells us, to, and it helps us to recognize that we aren't under the same compulsion of the Mosaic Covenant, but we are under a new system of giving that is generous, purposeful, and cheerful. So we teach, and I encourage you to consider, tithing should be thought of as your minimum, even as you look at the example of Jesus' life. And this is the wrestling reality when we think about our calling, when we think about our purpose, when we think about our purpose. Mark chapter 12, verse 28. Again, generosity beyond the tithe. Put that in the comments. Say generosity beyond the tithe. Turn to Mark chapter 12, verse 28. Question they asked Jesus. They said, Jesus? Maybe they didn't say it that way. That's how I'm saying it. I'm saying it with my, my country mama voice. Jesus. Jesus. Uh, which is the greatest commandment? Jesus responded to love God with what? All your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. It's important for us to hear the words that Jesus is declaring. Because I know many of us, you've heard that discipleship and your calling and your vocation and what God has commanded you to do is all about balance. Hallelujah. And you might be believed and you might actually believe that following Jesus, it means I give a tithe, but there's a bigger lesson. Jesus says, love me with all. That means love him completely, entirely, fully and totally. And the stress and the tension of your calling isn't that God de desires and demands 10%, but he might desire and demand 50, 75, 85, 95, 99. Matter of fact, and even if you've given 99, you might say, well, that sounds good. But remember, we're following the example of Jesus. Because when Jesus gave his life on Calvary, when he hung, when he bled, and when he died, he didn't give 10% of his life. Mm. He didn't give 12.25% of his life. He didn't give 50% of his life. He didn't give 72.3%. I know y'all tracking me. He didn't even give 99% of his life. He gave all of it. He gave all of his life. And if Jesus was willing to give all of his life, and I show you, there's a number of examples in the scripture. It's some of the ones that make some of the folks in my church feel a little uncomfortable. The Bible tells that rich young ruler, he says, go sell, go, go sell, give, and come follow. And he, he had to go and sell everything that he had in order to follow Jesus. That makes us feel a little uncomfortable that if Jesus said, your money might be an encumbrance to you following me. So that's why we want to make certain that we understand generosity beyond the tithe. Because Jesus gave all of his life. I'm going to let that sit for a moment. Say amen if you know Jesus gave all his life. Hallelujah. Say amen. Hallelujah. If you know he spilled all his blood. Hallelujah. Say amen if he gave up all of his breath. He gave all. Hallelujah. And so the call of God requires an economic witness and it's there and the witness of God that is on our life 
you and I have to answer. We got to answer the bill. We got to respond to the call. Hallelujah. So now here's the, here's the unique thing. When you start to assess and identify your own unique calling and the level of generosity God is commanding and calling you to, you have to also be mindful of those that you desire to enter into relationship with. Now we're going to bridge this in for those who are dating and courting. Because if you are courting someone, hallelujah, who is not about trying to purchase cars for unwed mothers or trying to give scholarships to children, but they're worried about going on their next Bermuda vacation, their next exotic location so that they can impress people on the gram. Hallelujah. If that's what they're about, and I'm not saying that there's anything necessarily demonic, evil, or wrong about it, but recognize the tension. The tension is that if God is calling you, hallelujah, to divest of your income, where you say, you know what? I have enough. I have enough. I don't need a bigger house. My apartment is, is enough for me. I don't need a, beautiful, a better car. The car that is paid off, hallelujah, with, one, with three hubcaps. I'm missing one. Hallelujah. That car is good enough for me. But if you want to, if you find yourself in the person you are dating and they're constantly concerned about the next status symbol, that potentially can become a place of friction. Thank you, Jesus. Why can it become a place of friction? Imagine this. Imagine if God, and I want you to know, your calling can shift. Your assignment can shift. So imagine if you had a high paying career, then God shifts you to become a teacher. Is the person that you're with willing to make the same lifestyle sacrifice that fits the, ec the economics of that particular career? Or will they put undue pressure upon you to remain a high earner so that they can stay a high spender? <laughs> Boy, that was a good word right there. Boy, I'm feeling it in my soul. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. What would God, if you're one of those persons and you just know you sold out for God, you love Jesus, that if God got you debt free, you might find yourself building habitat, building houses for habitat for humanity in, 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 in Mexico and in Guatemala and, and places like that. You might find yourself saying, you know what? This culture, this lifestyle, I ain't built for this. I'm not designed for this. God has placed a bigger burden upon me for the lost and for the weary, for the marginalized, for the hurting. And it can't be built upon me fighting to get the next skirt, finding the next sale on Amazon and, and dealing with all of that stuff. No, hallelujah. I need to be able to center and focus in on my assignment so that I can give all and know that God is going to make sure I always have enough. Because it's in the place of enoughness. When we live in the place of enoughness, in the place of abundance, that even when the world is scurrying and scared and thinking about scarcity and, and stocking up on toilet paper and there's fear mongering, specifically around the closing of the meat markets and, and various places all around the country. And you're seeing the shortage on chicken. Some of y'all don't even know that. Holly, you're hearing about the shortage on chicken and people are doing a rush and they're running. Hallelujah. Got to get all this chicken. I got to get it. And God is saying, you have enough. You have enough. Hallelujah. How do we, how do we know sometimes we struggle with this concept of we have enough and abundance? You ever been at some of our uh, parties? You ever been at some of our parties, our shindings for our families? And, and we like to think that it's a great party when we got to bring home eight, nine, ten pieces of Tupperware. <laughs> Hallelujah. With all this food. And really, it's a recognition that because we've been so afraid of not having anything for later, that the premise of having just enough for now scares us. The idea, hallelujah, that, that God will say, you know what? I'm going to provide manna for you every single day. I'm going to take care of you every single day. And because I know God is going to take care of me, that releases me to let go. That releases me from the frightening task that says, okay, God, I'm going to embrace you 
in this process of generosity. I'm going to believe you because remember, even if you say I'm a tither, immerse yourself into the tithing perspective of what was in, what was embedded in the mindset of the Old Testament. The tithing perspective was about preparing, allowing people to be prepared for worship. Hallelujah. It wasn't just to give a tenth in order to take care of the ministry. It was also being able to say, you know what? I want to make sure that people can worship God. I want to be able to release people from the financial burden where they are encumbered with the thought, hallelujah, where they can't even be focused on God because they are fixated on their next meal. So because God says, I am placing within people this mindset, this approach, hallelujah, he says 23, 20, roughly 23%, 23.3% roughly, okay, was what they were expected to give. So that's why I want you to think about generosity beyond the tithe because God places within us a willingness to lift the burdens of other people. Scripture says it this way, and I know most of y'all think that this is what Spider-Man's dad told him. Hallelujah. To much is given, much is required. Hallelujah. To much is given, much is required. When we make more, it's not designed for us to spend more. When we make more, there's a greater responsibility that will give more. Hallelujah. Do you not know that it's possible that the increase you got, hallelujah, this year wasn't actually meant to be yours? It was meant to be, a, you were meant to not be a, a cesspool of accumulation. You were meant to be a channel of distribution. The Bible says it this way. Hallelujah. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Hallelujah. You are not a pool where only things come to you and nothing comes out of you. God wants to make us a channel of distribution where we're not just tearing down barns to build a bigger barn. And then once we get a bigger barn, we tear down that barn to build an even bigger barn. Bible says it this way, hallelujah, a man's life does not consist, excuse me, of the abundance of things which they possess, all right? So here's the thing when we talk about being an economic witness, and this is going to mess, this is going to mess with some of us, because if generosity is to go beyond the tithe, that means you're going to have to voluntarily limit your consumption. voluntarily. It can't be something your pastor makes you do, your husband makes you do, your friend makes you do. When you have a call on your life, you're going to have to voluntarily curtail your appetite. You're going to have to voluntarily limit how much you elect to spend so that you are free to be generous. Remember, generosity is planned kindness. You ever hear people say, well, I'm giving this out of the kindness of my heart. And usually when they say that, that simply means that they watched some infomercial and they saw something that tugged at the purse strings uh, of their heart and touched their emotions and it prompted them to give sacrificially. But a generous soul plans to be kind. That if I'm Kindness is not an accident. You plan to do it. Hallelujah. You're, you, you, you plan to, to be able to help someone pay their rent during this time. So that way your generosity doesn't become undue stress for you. Because you have voluntarily curtailed your own consumption in order to be a blessing to someone else. Scripture, many of us, we have to remind ourselves, you know, you are blessed, not for yourself. <laughs> when God blessed you and when God blessed me, oh, that felt good in my spirit. He blessed you to be a blessing. He blessed you to be a blessing. Thank you, Lord Jesus. He blessed you to be a blessing. All right. So I want to make sure um, I want us to think about voluntary limiting our consumption uh, for some of us, there's another thing that God will also do is that God is going to deliver us from our unhealthy attachment to stuff. There's some stuff God is saying, you need to let it go. That means you need to donate it. You need to give it to somebody else. Hallelujah. Woo! I felt you. I see all them shoes in that closet. 
Hallelujah. If you got shoes you ain't wore in a year and you still waiting to curate the outfit that's going to go with it, it might be the Lord trying to touch your heart to say, you know what? It's time to let that go. Be a blessing to someone else who may not even have a single pair of shoes. Thank you, Lord Jesus. All right. So the other thing that I like to um, not only uh, in terms of curtailing our consumption, planning to be kind, but we also want to be discerning. We want to be discerning with our generosity. Here's why I'm saying that. Um, just because you have to give doesn't mean you're supposed to give. Now, this is the part that makes it difficult. Um, it makes it challenging because I, you know, y'all know what it's like. We got loved ones. We got family members. They run into difficulty. They run into uh, challenges. And, and many of them know, hey, you might be that person that never buys anything. You are the one who is voluntarily curtailing their consumption while they are uh, living that prodigal life. <laughs> They living that life. You know, the prodigal son, he took all his inheritance, went out there, hallelujah, living wild. Stripper over here, or excuse me, all, you know, all that kind of stuff, just living wild. And uh, ran out, uh, famine came, and, uh, and, and so they then approach you and they say, all right, help me out, help me out. And, and, and because we plan to be kind, that doesn't necessarily mean that we are to be the ones because we want to make sure that we don't deify ourselves that we don't embrace the illusion that we're everyone's Messiah and Savior. So here's what we must do, that even as we are intentionally curtailing our consumption, even as we are planning to be kind, we still have to be prayerful with our generosity. We have to be prayerful with the kindness that we show. Now, here's the thing. There are some people who are so prayerful and so discerning, they're never kind. I ain't talking to you. I'm not talking to you. I said, I ain't talking to you. Hallelujah. You too, you too deep. You ain't never, been, you ain't never, no, no, they, they just stop. There are times when our generosity should just be, you know what? As you're discerning and you sense someone has a need, it's not because they deserve it, because you're reminding yourself, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. How many times have you received things you didn't deserve? How many times have you received mercy that you didn't deserve? And so as we are prayerful and discerning, that means before we express that kindness and generosity, we bathe ourselves in prayer. We bathe that request in prayer and then we distribute, designate appropriate. Does that make sense? Hope it does. If you need scripture for that, don't forget sometimes I, you know, personally, and even as a ministry, we try, we have a practice of taking three days for requests. Where does that three day come from? Obviously, Jesus got up in three days. Uh, but also in the book of Joshua, uh, there's a story about a particular tribe that came to them and uh, they pr they pr pretended to be paupers. They pretended to be poor. Um, and then Joshua entered into covenant with them, the Gibeonites. And then later on, three days afterwards, they found out uh, that they had portrayed themselves uh, in, a, in a light that was not authentic and true. All right. So that's the best way that I can say. The other way that I can say it again, God also wants to liberate us from our own idol of believing that we're everyone's deliverer and everyone's Messiah. We are a part of the kingdom of God. Here's what that means. We can pray and God can send it through someone else. We have done that so many times. I've seen it so many times. We had, uh, I, I can remember a precious one uh, came and was going on a college tour wonderful college tours, something that my wife has benefited from and uh, has, has constantly uh, um, shared with me and others about the benefit of going on these college tours. And so because that's in my mind, because of her experience and even my own experience, when this particular person came and said, you know what, I want to go on this college tour, immediately I felt a desire to want uh, to be able to fund and to be a part of helping that, uh, that particular endeavor. And so as we prayed, um, the Lord said no. Hallelujah. Now, here's the thing. It was difficult for me to tell the person no, because I actually had it within my possession to help them. And so in my mind, I'm like, God, this is really hard. But because we are discerning with the outlet of our generosity, as I said, no, here's what happened. God actually had in mind for someone else to do it. So if I had done it and God actually wanted to do it another way, I would have been, you know, get my big head in the way. So it's important for us uh, to be discerning in that particular regard. All right. So with that being said, we're almost close to time. 
Last passage that I want to share with you uh, is Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. Now again, this is in that Sermon on the Mount. This is where your treasure is. Come on, type it out. Hallelujah. Where your treasure is, there your heart will lie also. So when we think about our call, um, our calling and our money, it is a matter of heart. And the possibility of this, I need you to understand something. The fact that our hearts can be steered by money is a scary thing. Let me say that again. Our heart is tied to our calling, but God also knows that our hearts can be steered by money. It's why some pastors have even been steered away. Even as they teach tithing, it's become filled with fear because God knows. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Help all of our shepherds, God. Help all of our spiritual leaders during this time. God knows that all of us has the propensity. All of us, it's possible to be tempted by the allures of money. Hallelujah. God knows all of us, all of us, our hearts can be steered by money. Our hearts can be steered by that which we are refusing to let go of, what we hold fast to. There is this, um, this idea for believers, me and, uh, me, and, me and some of the saints, we talk about this, uh, this concept of death and resurrection, death and resurrection, death and resurrection, that for Christians, we have to let some things die in order to experience resurrection. That means we have to let some things go. We have to let go of our need to control, our need to, <laughs> our, our need to fix everything so that we can experience the resurrection life that only comes through Jesus Christ, all right? So again, Last final thought, our heart, it is the control center of our will and the relationship with our treasure is that it can focus our heart upon it. So if my heart is focused upon accumulation and keeping and only giving a tithe, hallelujah, then I, will, I can miss out on the generosity that God is expanding and enlarging in us in order to be a blessing uh, to other people, all right? So, man, whoo, I got so much more, but we're almost at time, hallelujah. But I hope that you have been encouraged uh, by this particular thought and principle of generosity beyond the tithe, um, that as we've explored, even what the Bible teaches about the tithe, recognizing that even when it teaches about tithing, it's more than 10%. And so, yes, we're grateful for those of you all who have met the place where you're giving a 10, but recognize that that might not be all what God is requiring of you. Excuse me. God may be requiring of you the kind of call, hallelujah, that demands that you be one of those persons that's willing to give all. Hallelujah. That's part of the sacrifice. That's a part of being able to find the fulfillment that Christ died to give us. Now, um, you know, again, you want to reflect on this. This is a conversation. Now, for those of you all who are already... Uh, you booed up and you married. Hallelujah. You can't decide. She ain't generous. I'm getting rid of her. No, it's, you, you already crossed that threshold. Hallelujah. You already jumped there. So now you got to pray for her heart and, uh, and or you got to pray for his heart. Hallelujah. You can't decide uh, and force somebody else to be generous. You got to pray that God would cause their heart uh, to match your assignment. Because you've already made a commitment to them, all right? So don't you come, don't you have nobody sending me no text messages and saying, you you told my, my wife to leave me, the devil is alive. Don't you do that to me, hallelujah. All right, but I love you guys. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, our next discussion, hallelujah. We will be having our next discussion on Zoom. Now, this Zoom discussion will be a question and answer time. Question and answer. So we're going to be talking again about money and money matters. And uh, what I would like to do is that I am going to ask you all, if you'd like to, send me your questions in advance. Anything about money. And I'll do the best that I can to give you a biblical, scriptural, uh, and spiritual perspective of it. And then we can just have a dialogue about these things and, and, uh, and share with you all uh, some of the things that we've, uh, we've talked about before. And like I said before, um, that... My, my job is not to get you 
to think exactly how I think. I have a very particular call. And so the way in which God has given me to deal with our finances, my money, and the money that he has blessed me with, uh, is a reflection of the values he's given me. So I have a certain risk profile. I have a certain um, consumption profile. I have five children. All presently, we believe they're going to go to college. So all those things I have to plan, prepare for. And so there's things that I have to say no to, things I have to say yes to. And it may not necessarily be your calling, but to much is given, much is required. And so we all have to uh, discern what will be our relationship with money. That will be a reflection of our relationship with God. And so I want to offer to you uh, these things to help you to shape it. Amen. To be transformed by it and to be encouraged by it. All right. So with that being said, here's what I'm going to do. Like I said, our next discussion will be a Q&A so you can write down your questions. I always encourage you to write your questions now because I promise you when we get to next month, you're probably going to forget Hallelujah! some of the things that are percolating in your spirit now. I know some of you all might say, well, what are some of the books that we can read? Let me, if you uh, let me know, I'll, I'll get a whole list of different resources and material um, that I can recommend to you or what have you so I can have that for you guys as well. All right. And uh, but before we go, I want to pray. I want to pray uh, with the people of God. Let me take some tea. <coughs> Hallelujah. Let us pray. Gracious God and Father, we thank you. We thank you that as you have uh, downloaded into our hearts and our minds the wisdom that can only come from you, we thank you that you have not only challenged us, but you've changed us in the same moment. And as you've changed us, you are aligning our purpose, our calling, and our will to be consistent with what your purpose is for us. So, Lord, as we surrender to you, God, give us wisdom on how we are to manage our financial affairs. Lord, remind us on this week and for the entirety of our life that we are to bear economic witness to the unique call of God that is upon our life. So, Lord, even as we are growing in our generosity... Help us, O oh God, to be discerning and help us, O oh God, in the name of Jesus, to find the right outlets, the right persons, the right institutions, the right scholarships, whatever that may be. Show us, O oh God, those persons that we are to be generous to. And God will be careful to give you all the praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name, thank God and amen. God bless you all. I love you. Hallelujah. Holy hugs. Holy hugs. Say hi to your pastor. Oh, I should say, say bye to your pastor. Bye, Felicia. Hallelujah. Bye, y'all. I love y'all. Hallelujah. Okay. Bye, Mama Renee. I love you. Way out in Fresno. Bye, Lady Brittany, prayer warrior. Bye, Sister Christine. I love you. Bye, Brother Charles. I love you, man. Bless those sons for us. Hallelujah. Bye, Sister Rebecca. Bye, Sister Carolyn. I love you, Mama C. Hallelujah. Love you, love you, love you. Sister Olivia, I love you, sis. Hallelujah. I speak prosperity and wealth upon each of you in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Pastor Hillis, God bless you, man of God. Hallelujah. Prayer warrior and preacher. God bless you, man of God. I love you. I love you. Amen. To all of God's people, peace and prosperity. Enjoy your Friday night off. And may God continue to keep you and bless you with his divine wisdom and favor.